Last time we were in uh, Genesis, we looked at Genesis 3, 8 through 15, and we looked at God's grace and mercy that was shown towards the rebel. And we saw it in the in three ways. Uh, God seeks for the rebels, whereas Adam and Eve hid, God came down and pursued them. And then second, we saw that God confronted the rebels. And that was an act of mercy and grace. God asked questions, becoming more and more pointed so that he may lead Adam and Eve to the issue of their sin. And then the third way that we saw God's grace and mercy is that God promises to rescue the rebels. God promised to send a savior to crush the head of Satan. As we work through the rest of the passage, we will see three more ways in which God's mercy and grace is shown. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We'll be starting at verse 16. And there we read, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed it is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. And you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. When the Lord God's, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the tree of life. So here we see God's mercy and grace in the following three ways in which he responds. And in verses 16 through 19, we see God's mercy and grace revealed in that he judges the rebels. Now that may sound strange to us. How is judgment ever merciful? Well, let's see what the judgment is. In verse 16, we read, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, we have two parts here. The first part, we see the judgment. The second part, we see an effect of sin. Let's take that second part first, the effect of sin. And what we see here is, is that because of sin, the woman would try to rule over the husband. Now we see this in society. You see it on TV where the husband is often depicted as the goof and the wife is the one who is ruling the roost. You see it also in, in more subtle ways. In such phrases like, the husband is the head the wife is the neck which turns the head. Both of these examples reveal to us an undermining of God's design. Remember back to Genesis 2. God created man first and then created the woman as his helper. God put man in the position of spiritual leader of the husband wife relationship. God is saying that this structure of a husband as head of his wife, this structure 
will always be under attack. As sin will entice the woman to usurp man's God-given role as leader. And this will lead to dissatisfaction in their marriage and in their family. So that's the second part. Here's the first part. With the first part of this verse, we see the judgment given by God to the woman. And that judgment is an increased pain in childbearing. Now, as husbands, we may have seen how this affects our wife, but we definitely do not understand the severity of it. Now, increased pain in, in childbearing sounds only like judgment. Where is the mercy? Oh, Eve would live to be a mother. Adam saw the hope in these words and said to his wife in verse 20, the, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So Adam saw the hope here. Adam saw that Eve would continue to live. Where else? What, what, what other sort of mercy do, do we see here? Well, this increased pain in, in childbearing would be a reminder of the fall. And it would bring up questions such as, why is there pain? Which then would lead us to examine maybe what the Bible has to say. And then we're reminded of sin. And when we're reminded of sin, we're reminded that we need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. Now in Genesis three seventeen and 19, God turns his attention to the man, to Adam, and he judges him. Let me read, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We see here the judgment. God curses the ground. As a result, he makes work toilsome. It would be back-breaking work to plant the fields and provide food for the family. Work is no longer a joy. Work becomes a struggle, becomes labor. Again, this sounds only like judgment. Where's the grace and mercy found in these words? Well, it's in the fact that this life would not offer complete satisfaction. There is a holy dissatisfaction. And it is this dissatisfaction that moves us to find that which truly satisfies. And as God continues to work on us, drawing us, we begin to realize that true satisfaction is only found in one place and in one person, and that is Jesus. So God's mercy and grace isn't seen only in that he judges the rebels, but he provides a covering for the rebels. We read in, in verse 21, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Now back up here for a moment. Adam and Eve had already made garments for themselves. We read in verse 7, and the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You know, Adam and Eve were very innovative. They saw what was around them. They noticed that there were some fig leaves that would be big enough to sew together to cover themselves. 
And so what they did was they took that and they began to work on it. And they made a loincloth to cover themselves. I mean, that's pretty innovative. They took something that was around them and they sewed it together and made something that they thought was fit. But you see, man's way, even though it may be innovative, is not God's way. That's something we must all learn. Do not seek man's innovation, but God's design. To seek man's innovation over God's design is just as foolish as wrapping fig leaves together and thinking that is fit to cover yourself. Don't settle for second best. Settle for what God's design is and no less. And apply that to all areas of your life. Apply it to your family, apply it to your work, apply it to your friendships, and especially apply it to when it comes to the church. Wrestle with what God has designed his church to be and do. Now there's something more to why God covers them with skins. For there to be skins, there must be death. An animal must die. Forgiveness is only offered through the blood of sacrifice. That's what we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, which is a uh, partly a reiteration from the book of Leviticus. And we read, in fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You know, I've always, often thought, why didn't Adam and Eve die right there? Why did they continue to live for over 900 years? I think I know the answer now. An innocent victim took their place. The innocent victim covered up their sin. Right here, what we have is a setting up of the sacrificial system that would later be fleshed out during Moses' time in the wilderness. And as we know, the sacrificial system pointed to Jesus. You see, what we have here is a picture of the gospel. We are Adam and Eve. Sinners, guilty, rightly guilty of death. The animal reminds us of Jesus, the innocent substitute that takes our penalty upon himself and in whom we are clothed and thus spared. What a wonderful picture this is of the gospel. Have you come to embrace this? Have you come to embrace Jesus' death for, you, for yourself? so that you may be covered by his blood? That you may be covered with his righteousness, so that you may be spared death? Oh, I hope you do. Now, what happens here in verses 20 and 21 is also a crucial part in understanding chapter 4, where God doesn't receive Cain's sacrifice. You see, God dictates how we worship. And, and what he wants from us, how he wants us to worship. So God's mercy and grace is shown in that he judges the rebels and he provides a covering for the rebels. Finally, it is shown in that he banishes the rebels from the garden. Now, again, this may st sound strange to us as, as well. How is this a gracious Act. How is being kicked out of paradise, of a wonderful, beautiful, amazing garden, an act of grace? Well, consider what is inside the garden. There was two trees, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and also the tree of life. 
And starting in verse 22, we read, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every which way to guard the way to the tree of life. So why did God banish Adam and Eve from the garden? It was so that they would be unable to reach out and take from the tree of life and eat from it and live forever. You know, there's a song that my my dad uh, introduced me to, and my dad loved uh, the older um, classical rock. And um, there's a band by the name of Queen, and the song title, uh, one of their songs was "Who Wants to Live Forever." You know, that's such a good question. Who wants to live forever? Do you want to live forever here on this earth? What is what is so wrong with living forever here on this earth? I mean, isn't that how many people are acting today amid this health crisis? Many are, are living as at their guarantee tomorrow, putting everything and everyone on hold as they bunker down in their homes waiting for the virus to pass them by. They think they have all the time in the world. Who wants to live forever? Apparently a lot of people do. But think about it. Think about the world that you live in. There's a lot of good stuff that happens. There's family. There's fun events, bonfires, beautiful scenery, cool animals to look at. There's a lot of nice stuff in this world. At the same time, there's a lot of evil in this world. Injustice, struggles, corruption, suffering, misery, hatred, violence, and just plain evil. Now think of all that, all the darkness. Now imagine if you could never escape that. Had Adam and Eve been permitted to eat from the tree of life, then they would have been forced to live eternally in a broken and sin-cursed world. Not just them but all of their offspring. That includes us. By enforcing the penalty, God shows mercy and grace. For a believer, death is the release from this cursed condition of sin and this cursed broken world. For a believer, it is to be ushered into a place of perfection, of joy, of satisfaction, and endless life. It is to be ushered into the arms of Jesus. It is to be ushered into paradise. God banishes Adam and Eve from the garden and places two angels with a flaming sword to block the tree of life for their own good. But not only that, but it's also for the fulfillment of his promise. God must fulfill his promises if he is faithful and just. And the promise that he made 
was in Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. For them to die, they had to be removed from the tree of life. And so, because God is faithful, and he is just, and he is right, he banishes them from the garden. But God is also good. And gracious and merciful. And he's prepared an even greater paradise waiting for them and for all of us who put our faith in his son. To the chief on to the thief on the cross that responded to Jesus in faith, Jesus said to this, Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise in the Greek implies a garden-like paradise similar to Eden. Heaven is not Eden. Eden is not heaven. But like Eden was, heaven is is no sin, no curse, no sickness, no death. Needs are met. And the greatest thing, we dwell with God. It will be paradise. God is gracious. God is merciful. We do not deserve heaven. It's only through his son that we are able to go to heaven to be with him. And heaven is such a wonderful place. It's a beautiful place. But heaven isn't our final destination. The book of, he of Revelation teaches us that we will enjoy a new earth. And in this new earth, there will be a tree of life which we will enjoy and eat from. So as we can see in Genesis chapter 3, though we often look at this chapter through a very dark lens, negative lens, though all we see is his judgment upon mankind, which is rightfully deserved, we also see his grace. We also see his mercy. God is just. And he is also gracious. He will justly give us the penalty that we deserve. But he graciously offers forgiveness through his son, because his son took the penalty upon himself and suffered and bled in our, our place so that we may enjoy God forever. Starting today and going until we arrive in heaven and beyond. God is gracious. God is merciful. Praise the Lord.